Hallelujah. Hopefully tonight we can share something with you that will inspire, encourage, speak to you. Uh, there's something that the Lord dealt with me a while back, and I've been sitting on for a little bit, and I just feel tonight would be the time to share it with you. I'm praying that whether it be somebody here, somebody online that may need to hear, I know we have a lot of different people that follow and listen online, so God bless you. Thank you for watching and listening tonight. We're going to be turning to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 20. And we're going to turn in over to verse number 7, and we are going to preach from a story that I preached from in the past, but I just feel compelled tonight that it will speak to you, and I pray in a fresh way. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, and if you love to understand the Bible more and more, I believe that if you'll pay attention, you'll walk away knowing something or have a greater depth of understanding So Acts chapter 20, verse number 7, and if you have it, say amen. All right. So the Bible here says, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again, did anyone else read that? Look at verse number 11. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. This is the thought that I'd like to talk to us on tonight. Uh, Again, I just feel compelled that somebody really needs this. I'd like to talk to you on the subject title, coming back from a hard fall, coming back from a hard fall. Will you pray with me tonight? Lord, I know that someone needs to hear this message as you've laid it on my heart to breathe into this congregation to those online. I'm praying, God, that you will speak expressly to every heart and every life that stands in need, even now, Jesus. We give it to you. We put it in your hands, and I pray, God, that you'll give the increase in Jesus' name, and everyone can say amen. So I'd like to talk to you, as I said tonight, on the subject title of coming back from a hard fall. If you take a step back into the story itself, you'll find that the Apostle Paul here, the Bible shows us that he's preaching in a place called Troas. And this is the day before that Paul is to depart from there. He's preaching in what appears to be a two-story, possibly three-story meeting place. So if you can picture in your mind that Paul is preaching in some building, and it's a two- to three-story building. It's a high place. And the Bible describes how that Paul starts preaching, uh, estimated, the Bible shows us that he's preaching about six hours. That's why the Bible says he was long preaching. He starts preaching somewhere around the six o'clock hour, and he preaches all the way up till midnight. And if you think I preach a long time, 
Imagine preaching or listening to somebody preach for six hours. That's a long time. But the Bible's very detailed in the fact that it says that there's many lights in the upper chamber where they're gathered together. It's also very unique that the Bible points out a man that we've never heard about or we don't really know much about, probably better said, a man by the name of Eutychus. Others have pronounced his name Eutychus. But the Bible says that he's falling into a deep sleep. There's a difference between just a light slumber and a deep sleep. How many has ever fell into such a deep sleep somebody could shake you, talk to you, try to get your attention, and you, you're not aware. You didn't even realize what was going on. The other night when I got really bad sick, it was about 2.30 in the morning, I got up, and, man, I was throwing up so loud. I mean, you know, when you start hurling, if you will, and you make, it's just a loud noise, you know. You, you make a lot of racket. And my wife, boy, she was in the other room, and normally every, you could just breathe, and she wakes up. She was sleeping right through the middle of it. So I'd say she was probably in a deep sleep, had to be in. Uh, but here's this young man, and he's in, the Bible tells us he's in a, fallen into a deep sleep. And some might think or surmise that maybe it could be that Paul was boring. I don't think that was the case. I think that Paul was an anointed man of God, and I think that what Paul is doing, he knows that he's about to depart from this place, and he's leaving, going on to do ministry somewhere else. And so he realizes this might be one of his last opportunities to squeeze as much of the doctrinal truth and the gospel in as he could before he has to leave this place called Troas. And I believe it has more to do with the fact that Paul is a man who lives a very dangerous life. There's a lot of people who would like to kill Paul. Every time he turns around, he's being beaten with stripes, or he's in a shipwreck, or he's being thrown in a Roman prison. So Paul knows that it's very possible that he may never see Troas again. So before that he leaves, he's going to do everything he can to preach to this crowd that is in this upper chamber. Well, unfortunately, among those people that are gathered there that night, there's this young man by the name of Eutychus who's picked out a very strange place to sit in. Maybe it was elbow to elbow, and he just decided, you know, it's more convenient for me to sit right here in the window. I've got fresh air. I've got a place where that I can kind of sit down. I can get away from the rest of the crowd I don't know, but somebody agree with me. He picked a very dangerous place to sit that night, especially given the fact that during the long hour of Paul's preaching, he begins to sink down into this deep sleep. And what I want you to see that is after a period of preaching and time, this man, as he sinks down into sleep, he was probably, most likely, I don't want to fabricate anything but I know how it is when you fall into a deep sleep and you understand what I'm saying. How many's ever drifted off before? Slowly, little bit by little bit, you start doing what we call nodding off. Anybody ever get real tired in the middle of something? You, your eyes begin to get real heavy and before long, you, your head starts bobbing a little bit and you start kind of diving down. Usually, you start feeling the effects of tiredness and being sleepy long before you ever fall into a deep sleep. Unless you've got a medical condition, most people don't just sit down and in a matter of a split second fall into a deep sleep. Usually, it is a gradual process. And I can only imagine, Sister Marissa, when I think about this young man, Eutychus, as that as he begins to fall asleep, I see him in my mind beginning to nod a little bit here and there. His head beginning to possibly bob a little bit as he feels himself falling into a deep sleep. How many of you know that if you feel yourself falling asleep and you realize there's danger, it is your job to get out of the window seal. Say amen. Anybody ever been driving a car before and you feel yourself getting tired? I can remember years ago I was headed down doing Publix's overnight working on a job. And I remember it after drive two and a half, two hours and 45 minutes one way and it would be late at night. It might be 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I remember driving down those long blank 
you know, roads where there's hardly any other cars on the road. And here you are driving almost three hours late at night, and my eyes would begin to get heavy, and I would do all sorts of things to keep myself asleep. I would roll the window down and try to let fresh air hit me in the face, and sometimes that was just enough to try to keep me awake because I felt that sleepiness was coming over me. There were times that I would carry bags of peanuts or snacks and I would try to eat something to keep myself moving because I realized that the longer that you sit in one spot a place still your heart rate begins to go down and it makes it easy for you to fall asleep so if you keep moving it helps you keep from falling asleep man I wish I had time to preach that whole thing out because there's a lot of folk that have fallen asleep because they're not moving they're not fluid in the Lord and so they're becoming at ease in Zion and their heart rate spiritually is going down and they're falling into a deep sleep But this is what I see is happening to this young man. He is slowly, gradually falling into a deep sleep. And after a period of time, he does what a lot of us do, and we stop fighting it. I told a story to someone here recently. I was working back. I I was a young man. I was a workaholic. I would work anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day without ever thinking twice about it. And I had a company that I worked for. Do you know that if you work like that, there's a lot of companies out there that will take advantage of you. And I worked for a company. As long as I was willing to work, they were willing to work me. They didn't care if I hadn't slept in three days. It didn't matter. And I had done two or three jobs that day already they called me around 4 o'clock I think it was and they said we've got a night job that someone else called said they can't go to it was over near International Drive I said okay I went over there it was uh, near a McDonald's or in the McDonald's one of the two and so I worked all night long on stilts and so the next day they said can you go to another job now bear in mind I've been up I've been working now for over 24 hours and so I got in my truck I left International Drive. I headed down I-4. I got off at the Lee Road exit. And I remember when I got off of that exit, my plan was to get something to drink and then get back up on I-4. I pulled underneath uh, the I-4 and Lee Road exit to get back up on I-4. And while I was sitting there at the traffic light, hey man, the car in front of me was stopped and it was a red light. And I remember sitting there, Sister Kim, thinking to myself, I am so tired. Man, I am so tired. You know, I just feel so sleepy. I'm not going to clo- I'm not going to fall asleep. But if I could just close my eyes for just a minute or two, maybe I could feel a little better. I remember that I closed my eyes uh, while I sat there with my foot on the brake, thank God, that all of a sudden I woke up to the car behind me honking his horn uh, and it appeared as though I had already sat through maybe two or three lights that had turned red, green, and yellow, and now it was yellow again, and the guy behind me was ready to get up on I-4, but this guy in front of him isn't going. And so at that moment, I realized uh, that you can slumber so long until you fall into a deep sleep, and the reason you quit fighting it and you finally give in to it. Could it be that this young man named Eutychus, who sat in the window sill, here it is, Paul's been preaching six hours, uh, he's fought it as long as he could and finally he gives in to that feeling of sleepiness his eyes are heavy and he falls into a deep sleep did he fall out the window right away I don't know all I know is in his negligence in his being negligent about the place he chose to sit and the fact that he knew that he was getting tired he falls backwards out of the window and whether two or three stories down and he makes a hard fall into the ground below do you know that you can fall a few feet and break your neck I didn't even know this. About uh, maybe 15, 18 years ago, we were going to a church, and there was a man there that was working on a ladder, and they said he fell three feet backwards uh, and fell just right that he broke his neck. But I don't know, two or three stories, what is that? 20, 30, 40, 50 feet up in the air? Can you imagine falling backwards out of a window? Amen, several feet up from the ground and falling backwards. Uh, Well, the whole church that 
has gathered together to hear the word of God preached, uh, they realize that there's a man who's just fell out of the window. And can you imagine the chaos that ensues? All of a sudden, it interrupts the message uh, that Paul is preaching. Paul has been going at it. He's been laying a good doctrinal foundation. But now he's got a different problem on his hands. Uh, One of the participants that are in the crowd has fallen out of the window and is now laying dead outside on the ground. The whole entire church, I can imagine, that is assembled together begins to race toward the door. I can see them in my mind trying to get down to the first floor to try to find out, is he alive? Is he okay? Is there anything that we can do? When they get down there, they see this man laying lifeless on the ground. And when Paul sees the man, Paul in summary says, don't worry yourselves. This man's going to be okay, in other words. His life is in him. In other words, I'm going to pray for him, and God's going to restore that life back into him. If you know anything about the Old Testament, you remember the prophets, Elijah and the prophet Elisha. Do you remember where that Elisha laid himself over the Shunammite woman's son, and the, and the child sneezed seven times and came back to life? What we see happening in this text is a very similar overlay of what the Apostle Paul is doing to Eutychus. He is praying. He is overshadowing. He is letting what God has done in him be projected on a man who has foolishly fallen out, fallen out of a window from a high place. What I want you to see that there is a man who is laying dead on the ground, several floors down. The church is gathered around. The man of God is praying, and the man comes back to life. It's here that I want to show you something very powerful and I hope this will preach to somebody that desperately needs to hear this tonight. Have you ever had a place of your life that you fell and you fell hard? You see what I find about God's children and God's church is a lot of times we like to think more highly of ourselves than we probably should. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, I know Christians who that you, when you talk to them, you would think that she was the Virgin Mary, and you would think that he was the next thing closest to Jesus' kin. But if you get to know people, you begin to find out that most every child of God I've ever met has some area of place of their life, whether they have failed themselves, failed their family, or failed God. That doesn't mean that you've entered into some gross sin. But there are things in our life that sometimes that we don't like to talk about and we have to run to the mercy seat of God and ask for God's forgiveness. Anybody say amen to me? Just be honest. See, I pastored long enough that I met people that could sing good in the choir, but they wouldn't tell anybody that they they were negligent, they didn't tell their husband, that they were spending money that they didn't have. They overdrew their account. Their account got closed, and by the time the husband found out there was nothing they could do, financially it got them into a mess. Do you know that lying and being misleading uh, is still wrong? Say amen. And we still need the mercy of not just our fellow man, but we need the mercy of God. I've also known people that have got into some of the most difficult situations uh, that you catch them on any day of the week. Uh, They're going to be sweet. They're going to talk nice to you. They're going to be good to you. They'll pray for you. They'll even pray, God, by faith that you're healed in your body. But in a weak hour of their life, uh, like Peter was when he was tempted and they say, do you know that man? And he said, no, I don't. Uh, I've met people that hadn't cussed in 20 years. Uh, Then all of a sudden they say, I don't know what came over me. I said something I don't know, but I asked God to forgive me. Are we still human enough to admit that there have been some things uh, that we are not proud of uh, that we've had to say, God, I'm sorry. It may not be a cuss word. Maybe you don't smoke crack. Maybe meth ain't your thing. But maybe, just maybe, you found yourself when you were in the quiet of the night uh, being reminded by the Spirit of God uh, that you trashed somebody's name that afternoon sitting around a dinner table and you didn't think twice about it and you know good and well you gossiped you know good and well you ate them for dinner you know you were wrong you fell and you fell in a hard way can I tell you here tonight that no matter how you fall 
no matter how you fall backwards out of your situation, everybody that loves God, I'm telling you, this man apparently, he wanted to know more about God. Otherwise, I don't see him sitting in this place for all these hours listening to the man of God preach whether he was tired or not. He wanted something, and yet here he is, and now he's laying on the ground. What that shows me is that you can be among us and still fall out the window. You can be surrounded by some of the greatest people. Is there any better preacher I can think of in the New Testament beside Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul? And yet this man fell asleep in Paul's preaching. We think that if we get the church hot enough, high enough, and if we're preaching enough conferences uh, and we got a high enough attendance and all these other things uh, that somehow or another, that will mean that nobody will fall out of our windows. Uh, The reason people fall out of windows uh, is because of their own choices. Uh, You can have the greatest preacher in the house. You can have a room full of people that love God. You can be there for hours on end, days on end, years on end, but eventually Eventually, poor choices lead to a fall. Say amen. So this man, just because he's surrounded by many good people, it didn't matter. His choices led up to the place that he fell out of a window. Let me show you something tonight. Is that there are some people that I've known through the years that I never understood this that have fallen. And you know, sometimes these things, I don't know why I'm preaching this. God knows. Sometimes these things become public. Sometimes it may be something that only your, only your wife, only your husband knows about. Huh? It may be only your church is the only one. Your boss is the only one that knows about it. But nonetheless, it's become public, meaning it's more than just you and God that knows what happened. Are you following what I'm saying? Y'all don't get too quiet on me. Make, make, make me think you're guilty. Huh? And you need to come back from a fall. How am I going to get from ground level back up to the third floor? Tell me that. If somebody is not willing to leave the ranks of the third floor and come down to the first, you follow what I'm saying? Somebody's got to be willing Somebody's got to have enough compassion. What I'm trying to tell you is that one of the necessities for somebody to come back from a hard fall is not to do our little dance on somebody, grind them to powder, talk about them and say, oh, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? I mean, can you imagine how dumb that it would be for everybody to sit around the third floor looking at each other? Yeah, did you hear what happened to Uticas? Yeah. Let me post it. Let me text it. Let me call somebody. Let me, let me make a meme about it. Let me TikTok it. Let me, come on, let me do something. Amen. They're looking around the room. Do you know that if nobody would have ever gone down to the first floor, Eutychus would not have had a comeback. The reason why Eutychus had a comeback from a hard fall is first of all, the leader of the group, Paul, took the initiative to set the tone for everybody else that around here, that if somebody falls, even if I've got an agenda, man, I had a point I was about to make. I was about to tell y'all something really important, but there's nothing more important than a soul that's in trouble. And he ran down to the first floor to where he was at. Let me tell you, if people are falling out of the windows of the church, our first obligation is to make sure that we help those who have fell to come back from a hard fall. It, It hurts my heart. It hurts my heart. It really does. In 2023, I heard more than one story of people who that I've known and some of them that I've had confidence in that have fallen. Some of them have fallen in a hard way. You know, there's a lot of people that fall in a hard way and it's only by the grace of God that it didn't go public and nobody knew about it but them and their wife or them and God. But when it goes public... Do you know that the higher you go, the harder you fall? Am I right? A lot of times people, they glory. and Well, you know, he's, he's got 400,000 followers. 
Well, you know, he's pastoring a church of 20,000 people. Let me, t- let me explain to you. The higher you rise, the harder you fall. And I want you to understand that whether you see your situation or what you've been through, your failure in the eyes of the Lord. I'm preaching to somebody. I just know I am. Whether you see your failure in the eyes of God as I can never come back. I've let God down. I've let the church down. I've let this one down, that one down. Let me tell you, if your church will not run down from the third floor down to the first floor, you are, you get my phone number and call me. I will run to where you're at and I'll help you get up. If nobody else won't help you get up, call me. We'll get together. We'll pray together. Because if nobody else don't care about you, it's not because Christ doesn't care about you. It's because some of the people around you are not as concerned as they should be because at day's end, the Bible says that we're supposed to restore them that are taken in a fault. Is that not Bible, somebody? That means when a man falls or a woman falls, it is our obligation to help them get back where they need to be. What does that look like in real terms of Bible, of the story here? Here's what I want you to see happen, folks. I told you Paul went down there. He prayed for him. Do you know what happened after Paul prayed for this man? His life comes. The man gets up. They take the guy up. Huh? This is so powerful. And it has it's so many symbolic things here. They take the guy back up to this second or third floor. And when they get up there, they're breaking bread together. You know what that symbolizes? That symbolizes being fed. That symbolizes being nourished. That symbolizes togetherness, breaking bread together. That symbolizes family. That symbolizes togetherness, working together, cohesiveness. And what I want you to understand is if someone has had a hard fall, they need to be fed back to life. They need to be fed back to good health, should I say. This man was brought back up and treated with love. You know the reason why so many people fall out of the church and never come back? Let, 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 let me show you, okay? You ready for this? Can you imagine? Let's just paint a picture in your mind for a minute. Eutychus just fell out of the third floor window and he hit the ground real hard. You heard it when it thumped the ground. We were in a rural king here a few weeks ago. And my granddaughter was sitting on the edge of the grocery buggy. People call it a grocery cart in different places. But she was sitting on the edge of the buggy or whatever. And my son turned his head for just a second. And I don't know how in the world, but she flipped backwards out of the buggy. And the floor is concrete. And when her head hit the floor, you could feel it when in your feet when her head hit the floor, and you could hear it. There was a man standing 15, 20 feet away, and he could hear it. It sounded like a watermelon was dropped from 20 feet up in the air. I can't imagine what it sounded like, the thud when that man hit the ground. Boom! Outside. The gasp of the people in the room. Oh, my Lord, I wonder if he's okay. But let's paint a different picture. And this is more like what I see happening in some families and in some churches. Well, Paul's in the middle of what he's trying to say. Hey, man, I hope you're all right down there. But we up here, we... We were too busy, and you shouldn't have been in the window anyway. Carry on, Paul. That is no compassion. That is no love. And that arrogant spirit is why a lot of churches are weak and anemic. Do you know you can have every pew packed in a church and have a weak and anemic church? Because church can be built up on fun. It can be built up on entertainment. Or it can be built up on the truth and the power of the Spirit and the Word. I don't know about you, but I would rather be built up on the truth and the Spirit and the power of the Word. And to have a love that is reciprocal to the people that are around us. It's not my agenda. If it were in 2024... The story would probably look like this if it were some preachers. Hey, y'all, sit down. 
Don't y'all run down to the first floor. I'm almost done with my message. We'll get to him in a few minutes. Let me finish what I'm doing because I know I heard from God and God wouldn't have gave me this message. You know how people do. They make a thousand different excuses because it's all about me, myself, and I. Can I paint you another picture of what it would look like in some church circles in 2024? Well, if it would have been in our day, they'd all took their cell phone downstairs and they'd have broke out their cameras and video equipment and they would have videoed the whole thing. Look at what we're doing. Look at how good we are. Look at how we're trying to help somebody down on the ground. And let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with being excited about what God's doing. But I think that what some churches have done is turn some things into a theatrical circus. And it's all about look at us. I'd rather say look at Christ. Look at what the Spirit of God is doing in through us. Amen. Am I preaching all right tonight? The truth is that what happened that day is a necessity that needs to be practiced in 2024. It is that the people that love God understand all it would take is for me to have a day when I'm a little sleepy and tired Woe unto me that one night that I'm not paying attention and I go sitting down in some window seal and fall clean backwards and I need somebody to be there with me. You know what I found about life? There's a lot of things that come full circle. Now some things I can tell you are a little humorous. Other things not so much. I'll give you one that wasn't so much and then I'll tell you one that was humorous. Years ago, I was going through a real difficult time in my family. The enemy had pulled out every stop and had put its claws in every way possible to destroy me and my family and our ministry. And in the midst of that, you would think that the church folks would run down from the third floor and try to be there for you. But unfortunately, there were people who obviously never left the third floor and they were reporting back to some other station because they were doing everything they could to tear into us. Some awful things were said to me and my wife. And I remember making a post. If I went back, I could probably find it. And it said something along the lines of, you can say anything that you want to me, But just remember this, that you have sown to the wind and you will reap the whirlwind. You've gone out of your way to destroy my family. You have sown to the wind and you will reap the whirlwind. This family that was so together, we're better than everybody. We're holier than everybody. I don't glory in this. But that family fell completely apart not too long after that. You know, people can say what they want to, but things have a way of coming full circle. So you can look down your nose and you can look out the window and say, hey, should have never sat in that window in the first place. I'm sure he knows that by now. I'm sure he doesn't need you to report, Lieutenant, back and let him know that was a dumb decision. I'm sure he knows that now. He's got a big knot on his head and a few broken bones and he's dead. So I'm sure he knows that. But here's the thing. There are people who need people to have grace and mercy and love and compassion towards those who have fallen. And on a more humorous side, things come full circle. I was working in the yard today and I was thinking... I don't know why this came back to my memory, Um, but I was a teenager. And we used to go down to the Door Canal Bridge, which is right over by where you guys live. I mean, like right across the street, right across the street, that bridge. I grew up in that area, and I remember that we used to, we got into a lot of stuff. We didn't have a lot of the stuff kids had today. We went out, we played on bikes, and we did a lot of stuff, mischievous things. And I got a five-gallon bucket one time. 
filled it up full of lake water and stood on top of the bridge. And when a boat was coming underneath the bridge, had a boat full of people. Now they can't get to the bank real quick because they're in the middle of the water on a boat. And so I hid on the side, top of that bridge. And when that bridge came out from underneath there, I don't even know. I heard this made-up rhyme when I was a kid, and so this is why I said this. And, and when that boat kind of poked out from underneath and started to float a little farther, I took that bucket of water, that five-gallon bucket of lake water, and dumped it right in the middle of that boat. And there was a bald-headed guy that was in the middle of the boat, and that water just beamed off both sides of his head. And I said, bald and scalded 1940, hit him in the head, say, oh, my Lordy. Huh? And then we took off running. It wasn't but about probably 2014, and I was teasing with Brother Dean Smith because his hair was getting way back here, you know what I mean? And now y'all look at me. They said, I just need a... A mop and one of them big things in my ear, and I'll be looking like Mr. Clean. In all seriousness, though, we can humor that because the truth is a lot of things come full circle. I have known people in church that were real critical on somebody else's kids. I said, well, they've been married twice. And then, lo and behold, ten years later, their kids have been married three times now. Am I preaching all right, somebody? Because listen, God has a way. I don't know you call it a good sense of humor, but but life has a way of coming full circle. So I'd advise you to have a little bit of compassion because there might be a time that you look out the window and say, man, you should have never sat in that window to begin with. And you might be right. But what about the day when you need mercy, whenever you put yourself in a position you should have never been in? And you need the church and you need support and you need strength to get back and to have a comeback. I want to tell you this. I don't want to preach you to death tonight, but I want to tell you. There's some vital key components to have that kind of support. Has anybody ever been injured or hurt so bad that you really needed the assistance of another person to help you get back to where you need to be? Being sick here recently it was a big help. When my wife was sick... When as soon as I heard her throw up, the first thing I did, I went into the bathroom. I got a hand towel, got it in some hot water, wrung it out, brought it in there. I got her a bucket. I says, anything I can do to help you? She didn't, I don't think, maybe got as sick as I did. But then whenever I got sick a few days later, she was there trying to help me get my socks off when I couldn't pull my own socks off, help me get dressed or undressed. Because what I find is, is that you can become so incapacitated, you can be injured or be in a situation where that if it not for the help of another person, you will never get back to the third floor. I'm here to tell you that if you have had a hard fall, you're listening to me online or you're here tonight, maybe you might go through this in the, in the future. Remember me telling you this. Instead of pushing the people that were on that third floor away from you, you need those people. You need the people who understand what you've been through, who will help love you back to the third floor, who will be there to break bread with you and help you get back to good health. Can you say amen? Have you ever seen anybody that has fallen really hard and they needed a comeback? But when people try to get close to them, whether by the embarrassment of their situation, they push the church away. I've seen times before, Sister Kim, where someone fell and everybody heard about it. And do you know what they do? It's a human instinct, I suppose. Well, I don't want to go back to that church because everybody knows what happened. Sometimes the very people who knew what happened are the greatest testimony of all because when you come back, it will be proof that somebody who has fallen hard can come back. Because what you may not realize, and please never underestimate this, some people never come back because they don't think they can. They need somebody who will run down to the first floor wrap their arms around them and tell them, I saw what happened. How it happened doesn't matter, but I'm here to get you back up to that third floor. 
Would you agree with me as we close tonight, Sister Miranda, come to the piano. We'll play something here in just a moment. Would you agree with me that what I have preached to you tonight, that that, is, that, that should embody Christian character? Would that not be what you would expect Christ to do? I don't, I don't believe that a God who said in His Word that He came not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved would be on the third floor and see you fall out the window and say, Hey, boys, let him go. He made up his mind. Let him be. I got another point I got to make. No, I believe that the Spirit of Christ that was in the Apostle Paul was what led them to leave all of their agendas, to set time aside. That time that Paul had in Troas was valuable. But Paul set that aside. He set his agenda aside. He set his feelings aside. And he went to that man's rescue. Let me ask you tonight. Maybe it's not you that's fell. Maybe it's you that's not fell hard. Is there someone you know that just needs someone to help them get back up on the third floor? Is there? Is there someone that just needs to know that even if they're struggling in some areas of their life, that instead of an abrasive Christian who needs some WD-40, that you can have a little bit of compassion and love and try to be a little understanding and get them back to where they need to be. I'm 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 not advocating anybody overlook sin. I'm not advocating everybody to just go sit in a window seal. But what I am telling you is that when someone falls, it's not the will of God for them to die on the first floor. God has gone through too much to get us where we are to just let us die like that. Will you stand to your feet tonight? Somebody needed to hear this. I just have a feeling It would not surprise me one bit to get a call, a text, an email of somebody saying, you don't know how much I needed that. I needed to to know that. I've been real down on myself. I've laid on the ground bleeding on the first floor thinking about how foolish it was that I sat in the window thinking about all the decisions thinking about how I've hurt my family, thinking about all I've missed while the saints are up there and I was flying through the air and down on the ground. Time that I could have been where I should have been, but instead I was on the first floor. Instead of beating yourself up tonight, remember, you serve a God of mercy, love, compassion. I want you to stop whatever you're doing right now. If you can safely, whether driving, whether in this room, close your eyes for just a moment. If you can safely, however you got to pray, would you just first ask the Lord to forgive you? Lord, forgive me, please. I've had some areas of my life that I have fallen short, and I'm not, I know better than to try to mislead myself, you, or anybody else. I don't want to stay here like this. I surely don't want to die like this. I want to get back where I once was. I want to be back where I can hear the Word of God again. I want to be in that anointed atmosphere where the saints of God are having church again. I want to be where the power of God is again. If that's you tonight, I want you to find yourself a place. And I want you to pray and talk to the Lord. God, would you help me? You know that I have been drifting off into a deep slumber. Maybe you've almost fell out of the wind two or three times and you're just a few eye bats away from stopping fighting it and falling out of the window. Maybe this is a forewarning. Maybe God is using this to get your attention to let you know I've been watching you. You've made the decision to sit in the wrong places. 
you've made some dangerous decisions and you're drifting off in the wrong direction. There's no way that you can appreciate and receive that anointed preaching that is going forth in the same room you're in if you're there, but you're really not there. Somebody's going to get that. Let's find ourselves a place and pray tonight. Lord God of heaven and earth, I have done everything that I can imagine in my own ability with the grace of God empowering me to deliver the Word of God tonight. I pray that you will help souls strengthen them that need to be strengthened, deliver them that need to be delivered. Lord God, if I have made foolish choices, help me to overcome my own weakness. Give me strength. Help me to have the grace of God to make the right decisions because I believe that you can give me the power to walk upright. Is that you tonight? Just say, I need help, Lord. I want to serve you, Lord, with all of my heart. I don't want to make any foolish decisions. I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to get back into that place, that atmosphere. I want to come back. I can't stay here the rest of my life. I don't want to die like this. I want to come back from a hard fall. There was a place in my life where that I fell and fell hard. I realized I did. A lot of other folks know I did. A lot of other people know what I went through. The good news for you tonight is God knew it too. And He knew you'd be here. He knew that there would be people listening and watching online that needed to hear it. So tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God of heaven and earth, I just pray, Lord, that you'll smile down from heaven. Sweet Jesus, we thank you. We praise you, Lord God, for mercy. The windows of heaven are open, God. I pray that you'll pour out the blessing. We have not room to receive. I pray, God, that you'll help us to make that ascent back up to the place that we once were. We may need our friends and family. We may need our church to help us get back up the stairs. Gather around us. Help us get seated back down. Make a meal and help break bread and help us to get strengthened in our health again so that we can be used and utilized and receive. In Jesus' name, Lord God, smile down from heaven, I pray. See every need in this house. Oh, for every soul, God, that needs something tonight. God, show love and compassion in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, sweet Spirit of the Lord. I pray, God, wrap your arms around us in a time of need. God, you see where we've been and you also know where you want to take us. But for us to get where you want to take us, We have to acknowledge where we are. We have to embrace you and allow you to restore, to revive, to strengthen, to fortify. In Jesus' name. Let us pray tonight, God, do it in Jesus' name. Oh, sweet Lamb of God. Lord, I know, God, that the trials are many. But our our God is so much bigger and greater than all of these trials. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, sweet Spirit of the Lord. His mercy never fails. Oh, thank you for your mercy.